My name is Jerry Audette, and I am the managing editor of Surfcasters Journal and a freelance writer and photographer specifically focusing on surf casting for striped bass in the Northeast, though I write about a variety of things that is my primary focus at the time of making this video. I have been fishing for many years and I have caught thousands of striped bass, but beyond any of that, I am a very dedicated, data-driven, analytical, old-school and new-school surf fisherman who has a lot of knowledge and enjoys sharing that and helping you catch both more and larger striped bass. I think that I offer some unique perspectives and I think I see surf casting from a few different angles. I understand the trophy hunter, I understand the casual angler, I understand those who fish for reasons that go way beyond the fish, as that's how I personally feel. I fish all over the Northeast. I fish all kinds of different places, from sand beaches to boulder fields, estuaries, inlets. I am primarily a plug and fly fisherman, but I've fished eels and I've fished inlets and I've fished bait. I've kind of done it all at this point, though I've settled on a few things that I particularly enjoy, which includes things like wetsuiting in the boulder fields, um, fishing the large sand beaches, uh, uh, fly fishing estuaries, those kinds of things. But I have knowledge about all of the different places you can catch striped bass. In 2021, I launched the Surf Scenarios seminar series where I offered up a bunch of different topics for people to learn more about surf fishing for striped bass. Um, this was a huge success. I enjoyed it immensely, as I think everybody else who uh, watched it did as well. And I'm going to be continuing that for the 2022 series. Now, it's kind of broken up into two parts. The first is a more formal instruction type of seminar, where I'm going to have a topic, which I've listed at the beginning of this video, sand beaches, boulder fields, uh, plugology, big fish, etc., etc. Um, these are very in-depth. This is not going to be like what you get at a club talk or a fishing show. Uh, a lot of these will be 90 minutes, closer to two hours, just specifically focused on the one topic. I don't limit myself to time. I try to really cover whatever needs to be covered, regardless of how long it takes me. Last year, frankly, a couple of the talks were three hours or longer. But also, as part of these talks, I have all kinds of other little fun tidbits. We have a lot of stories. There's always tons of times for questions and discussion. Um, and I'll get to that again in a second. This year, I'm introducing a couple of new elements, some catch and release stuff, some behind the shot photography stuff. And I'm also going to do something that I think will be fun, which is looking back at my own season and giving a really authentic view of how I view my season, how I grade it, how I learn from it, the mistakes that I've made. So that's sort of the first part of the series. Um, the next part is in-depth interviews, much like you might get on podcasts, but these are live. So I'm going to be interviewing four different anglers, Al Obano, Dennis Sambroda, Craig Cantelmo, and Toby Lipinski. All of these guys have written many different articles. Some of them have books, some of them have been editors, some of them are regular columnists. Uh, they are all phenomenal fishermen who have fished all over the world and caught tens of thousands of striped bass between them, including many very, very big fish. These are some of the most talented anglers that I know. These discussions really, though, are getting more at the heart and soul of surf casting. I want to get into who the person is behind the surf caster. Why do they do it? What do they love about it? Why do they do certain things? What makes them different? What sets them apart? It's really hardcore guys. Of course, there's going to be lots to learn as well. We'll get down to nitty-gritty technical and tactics stuff. But really, I like to make it a little bit more in-depth than you might find elsewhere. Uh, last year, a couple of these discussions lasted for four hours. So we, we, we won't promise that again this year, but they will certainly be over two hours in length. Finally, I want to make a special note that as part of this series, which I didn't really consider how important this was last year, was you get to email me all your questions, your concerns, etc. Last year, guys really appreciated that they could send me questions about their season, questions about preparing for this season, follow-up questions 
that they may have not understood about the seminar. And then I either answer every email directly, or I'll take the more general questions or ones that I think will apply to the group, and I'll answer them anonymously to the whole group. This was really fun, actually, and sometimes would last 30 or even 45 minutes. Uh, answering some of the more complex questions or general questions or things that I may not have been able to cover as part of the more didactic material. So that was really fun. I'm going to continue to do that again this year. It was really rewarding for everyone, including me. I, I, really, I really enjoyed it. Now, again, you don't have to be live at these seminars either. If you can't make it at Wednesday at 7 o'clock, that's fine. Um, you still can email me your questions. You get one week to watch every single session after the fact. Even if you are live, you can watch it again as many times as you want, and that's only available to subscribers. So those who work night shift or can't make it on that particular night, that's okay because you can watch it at your leisure. You can listen to it in the car. You can wish, listen to it at work while you're doing something else. And then you can email me your questions and we'll follow up. Um, this is really a unique experience. It's all on Zoom, as you obviously know at this point. Um, and, it, and it really makes it very convenient for everyone and all up and down the coast. So we get a very diverse group with a lot of different ideas and concepts. And frankly, I learned a lot myself, you know, especially talking to guys in New Jersey, guys in Maine, places that I might not uh, visit as much. People doing things that I don't generally do. Um, you know, for example, one of the things that I really found that was more applicable to large fish than I thought was using algae snacks. That's just one tiny thing from the over 60 hours of content from last year's series. With that done, I'm now going to give you a few video clips from last year to give you sort of an introduction of what you're going to expect this year. The only changes are you're going to see even more of the types of drawings and graphs and stuff that you're going to see in the first clip. And the video quality and sound quality will also be increased this year through a new HD camera and podcast quality microphone. With that, uh, I thank you for making this far into the video. And if you have any questions, you can email me at the email that is found in the description. You can find all the written details on my website, indeepoutdoors.com, and it's also linked in the description. Thanks. We'll see you in uh, January. Now, let's go this way again. A lot of times, it doesn't exactly look like this, okay? So let's assume now that we've got some tidal movement that goes this way. So we got tide coming this way. Or we could have, make it a different color, we could have wind coming in like this. This would do the same thing, okay, if this is the prevailing wind. But we have something pushing this way. What's that going to look like? Well, it's going to do something like this. Whoops. Sorry. It's going to do something like this. Okay, so now what you're going to get is you're going to have the sandbar over here. But actually, I can't make a square. I've already tried this. So it's going to be in here somewhere, maybe. And this, I'm not saying there's always a sandbar, but I find this a lot, so I'm bringing it up because I think it's I think it's important. Sometimes what you'll get, you will have you know this square or circular sandbar. It usually looks something more like that. It doesn't look like a square like I made it look before. But sometimes you'll get something that looks almost like this. And that's because this current, this, this tide is pushing against the current, right? And so this is, this is an area of higher pressure, and there's a lot less pressure over here. And so I find this as well, and then what I find in this particular case, oops, I like to do it in green, is there aren't really fish over here so much. There can be, but they tend to be over here. And actually, I didn't draw it close enough. Let's, uh, let's draw it better. So it's perfectly clear here. Do something like that. It's maybe not quite that close because there's probably a space there, but you get my point. The fish will be in here somewhere because this is really pushed. So all the bait and all the crap is overwhelmed. It can't get out. It's stuck. But as soon as it starts to get pushed this way, it, it starts dropping right out of the current. So it'll be all in here. So this is also a really good spot. I do find as the tide continues to drop, I might find them here as well. And I think it's sort of the same thing where this over here, all of this pushing this way, 
it pushes this this water keeps getting pushed further and further and further over until it's essentially kind of going like this instead of turning out like that. So I do find fish here as well. Now, you might be saying to yourself, okay, but Jerry, I don't fish inlets, I don't care. Well, let me show you something. So let's say, okay, let's do this. Let's say this is a shoreline beach, okay? Let's say it's a sandbar, this is a sandbar, okay, and we've got a break. For those of you who have seen my boulder field talk, this is one of the critical slides. But this goes way beyond boulder fields, right? This, this is like, this is applies again to every single night, everywhere you fish, every kind of structure in my mind. And I really break down my fishing into four factors. Presentation, profile, action, and color. And that's what we're going to go through, right? Those are the four factors. And in that talk, in the Boulderfield talk, I spend maybe five to ten minutes talking about specifically what are the presentations to use in the Boulderfield, what's the profile, blah, 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 blah. But we're going to go into it every, in real depth, okay? So, but in that talk, I want to do this right from the beginning. In that particular talk, I throw this up at the end. I say, you know, of the factors that I use, if I had to represent their importance in terms of size of the lettering of the text, this is what it would look like. And frankly, it would probably look even, presentation would be even bigger and color would be even smaller. And the other ones would probably stay the same size. Uh, I really am in the camp of you can take the wrong lure and present it in the right way and you're going to get feedback. You're going to get hits, you're going to get nudged, you might catch a couple of small fish, whatever. So you're presenting the wrong thing in the right way, you're probably going to get hits. You can present the absolute perfect thing in the wrong way and never get a hit and never catch anything. And, 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 and this is something that I heard a trout fisherman talking about a long time ago when I was like um, in my like late teens. And it's really stuck with me. And that's really important to me. I think I've read it in a book. You could present the wrong lure the right way and catch fish, but you'll never catch anything if you present the right lure in the wrong way. Which is probably not exactly true, because lightning strikes somebody. Okay, so let's talk about presentation. Now, I already warned you in the email that this is going to be a little bit of stream of consciousness, and when I was practicing yesterday, I realized these bullets jump around a little bit, but... I think it's good, so. So I'm not going to go into skipping. I'm not going to talk about natural presentation, right? So I'm actually glad I did the jerking, gliding, blah, 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 the whole talk, and then also the current talk, because those are such important presentations. And they were, what, each two hours each? And so this makes this talk possible, because I don't think it would be possible without it. So I just want to bring up right from the beginning, though. If you want to catch bigger fish, and more fish, but bigger fish specifically, you have to be presenting your plugs naturally. And naturally, on most nights, is pretty quiet and subtle, right? Because that's normal bayfish behavior. We don't have to go over any more than that because we've gone over this a ton. This sort of gets to the same thing that I was just saying. Uh, and I threw this in. Um, I went for a bike ride this afternoon, and uh, I was thinking about this. And this was one of the things that popped into my mind that I wanted to make sure that I added. And that is that water movement and depth of your spot often dictate the majority or the completely the presentation. It's not necessarily the fish per se. So when you're fishing and when you're trying to decide what lures to use and what presentation to use, you're more trying to think about, trying to recognize and trying to learn what is the water doing? What is, what's, 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 how fast is it? How deep is it? How is it moving? Because then that will tell you what the prey is doing and also what the predator is doing. Okay? So, striped bass will... So, okay, so that was great introduction. Um, these are the same questions I asked everybody else. So, one simple tip for a beginner or the single biggest piece of advice you wish someone had given you when you started out. Those are kind of two different things, I guess. Yeah, no, I have, I have two answers for both. I was thinking about the simple tip for the beginner, and, I, you know, the first one that jumped into my head has been given, so I'll mention that, but it's not the one I'll give. It's the, the fish at night. I mean, that's just so obvious, but it is definitely one of, I'd say really with what I'm about to say, what I tell now people, new people the two most important things. So fish at night, and especially if you're coming over to the surf or salt in general from freshwater, 
is don't fish off clock. And what I mean by that, and I'll tell you a quick story, a guy that I got into surf fishing probably 20 years ago, uh, he was a freshwater guy. And I told him to go to a spot. And, you know, I, on the first time I said, go here at this tide stage, and everything else would be good to catch. And he, he caught. And then he went back the next week at the same time on the clock, 9 o'clock or, you know, 9 p.m., whatever. It's like, I caught nothing. Uh-huh. Like, uh-huh. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, whatever, he went back, 9 o'clock. Well, hey, he caught this time. And then there's this cycle. It took me a while to figure out what the hell was going on. He was used to freshwater fishing where he would wait for, let's say, 9 o'clock in the summer for the sun to set, and he would go catfish, let's say. So he was waiting for the sun to set, striped bass at night, 9 o'clock by the He didn't realize tide switching different directions. He wasn't taking anything else into consideration. Interesting. So I now say fish at night, but put the clock a little further down the line instead figure out or I'll explain to you what the tides are and start fishing off of that in conjunction with the night. And then the clock does make sense, but that's not why you're going out. You're not going out at a certain time of the night because it's that time on the clock. You're going, unless it's a right. tide clock, <laughs> at that tide stage. Does that apply to sunrise? Um, you mean as far as, uh, what do you mean? So, so, I mean, the dawn patrol is notorious for showing up at the same time each morning as the sun's coming up, you know, regardless of what else is going on. I'm assuming it still applies to the same thing. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, they, it, absolutely. Yeah, it's night, you know, any time throughout. You, know, even, it, you can even say if you're, you know, you fish the same, fishing during the day, again, more by the tide. I guess any time of the day, go by the tide before the clock. But if my first first part, you know, tip 1A is night, tip 1B is tide before clock. Yeah, exactly. And so what I was sort of insinuating, too, is if you're going to be dawn patrol, which there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do, but you have different spots. Have different spots. Don't go to the same spots every day or the same couple of spots at dawn or whatever. Because that way you're then you are not you're going during the same time, but you're chasing different tides or whatever. Right? Is that mm-hmm. fair? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the other side of it, the <clears throat> the thing that like what was it uh, that you wish you had been, been told. Was that? That you wish you had been um, told. Yeah, I, well I guess that's a two parter. The first part was what I said, appreciate things as they're happening when they are good, which I mean that's a, a general life lesson, but we never do it. So hard. Um, but the other was to, would be to, to, you know, back when I was first learning would be to keep things simpler. Um, I was always trying, I mean, I was into, I still am to a degree, into every type of gear and, and lure and everything. And I would bring a surf bag with a million plugs with me. And then eventually I got to this point, some, I haven't been, I don't know what, I can't pinpoint her when it occurred, but at some point I said, why am I carrying this giant bag with a thousand plugs and I'm fishing four of them? And I started dropping things back and less became more and really helped me maximize my fishing now. And so then I think, well, some of those crazy bites, if I had thought today's mentality of maximizing a given bite, what I could have done on top of what I did at that time um, would... You know, could it have, you know, would it have been much different? Who knows? But I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, that, that's a thing I think about. So, that, so that's a great point. And uh, I am notorious for feeling anxiety about not having something, about not having this or not having that. And what if this happens? And then three tubes are filled with the what ifs. And then there's three lures that are in the front of my stormer pack pocket half the time that I'm rotating through. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, so how do you how do you deal with that? How how do you so you're saying less is more, but how do you deal with what to bring? Maybe not specifically the plug, but like how do you actually do that in practice? I I talk about like a, a lot of times I get a lot of questions. I have got it for years with the fishermen. You know, uh, what plugs do you recommend now? You know, it's so-and-so date of the season it's spring first week of spring season or middle of summer you know what are you throwing this isn't going to sell any lures for any lure manufacturers but i pretty much have the same bag packed from the first day out in jay and i were just talking about last night we'll probably go in about eight or nine days my bag will look almost exactly the same as it will on the 15th of july as it will the day before thanksgiving it's the same plugs all the time it's my three tube i make a point not to overpack it so i pack my bag with 
two plugs in each tube, a couple around the outside and some soft plastics in the front, and then I'll close it up, and, but I'll go and look at it after a few minutes because I'll pack the bag ahead of time, you know, early in the afternoon or the yes, evening and get right. my stuff ready. Right. And I'll go and look back at it before I go, and nine times out of ten, I take one or two plugs out. So I'll be like, ah, why did I? I don't have a reason. There's no good reason to pack this extra plug, whatever it may be. I can do the same thing or cover the same piece of the water column with the other two I have. And if I'm going to fish just those plugs for an hour versus three plugs split in an hour, you know, I, I feel like I'm going to fish them better, more effectively, more thoroughly, and try to figure out why it is or isn't producing. So right. it just becomes this like mental battle of accepting, hey, there's times when I don't have what I need.